Buy me some peanuts and Cracker Jack. It is opening day across Major League Baseball. Time to root, root, root for the home team. The Toronto Blue Jays fire things up on Thursday afternoon against the St. Louis Cardinals. That will be game one of 162 for a team that has very big goals this year, a revamped roster, and we're going to get into all of it with Mike Wilner from the Toronto Star and the Deep Left Field podcast. Uh, Great to talk baseball. Always love when Mike makes a little time for us. Uh, Coming up on the podcast, just before we get to Mike, I want to let you know that on Monday morning with Rob out of town, it'll be Chris Hoffley sitting in the co-host chair, and uh, we will run down whatever is topical at the time over a couple of craft beers. And next week, while the Jays are in Kansas City, Dan Schulman from the Blue Jays broadcast team and, of course, from ESPN as well will join me to talk more baseball. It's that time of year. We want to talk a lot of baseball. Make sure you're prepared to follow along with us all baseball season long on social media at Tall Can Audio. We love to talk to you guys throughout the year and see what, uh, what's registering with you, what's on your mind. Maybe we get to some of that on the podcast. So follow along on Twitter and Instagram at Tall Can Audio. Make sure you're subscribed to the podcast on your favorite podcast app. With that, let's bring him in, Mike Wilner from the Toronto Star and the Deep Left Field podcast, currently uh, traversing across the state of Florida. How's it going today, Mike? It's going all right. It's, it's you know, it's weird. The last day of spring training and, um, you know, getting ready for the real deal, but uh, it's, it's pretty good. It's good to be heading home, too. Yeah, it's, I know how rough things can be in Florida. Everybody hates that in uh, <laughs> in March. Uh, well, yeah. yeah, I mean it's not that, but it's you know being away from home is never good. So true it's enough. always good to be back. True enough. Um, speaking of the podcast, why don't you take a minute here? Tell us what uh, what you've got coming up for us on uh, on an opening day edition of Deep Left Field. Yeah, I'm trying to make it a tradition in Deep Left Field to have a real. Uh, opening day extravaganza you know the podcast drops on thursdays and the season opens on thursdays and last year um i had a bunch of of the highest profile blue jays and we're going to do it again this year um the podcast that drops on on opening day will have george springer uh alec manoa vladimir guerrero jr and Danny Jansen and Jordan Romano together, uh, these guys who are like good, good buddies from, um, I don't know, 10 years ago when they were together in the organization, you know, came up together and, and uh, uh, they were on the podcast last month with Ryan Barucki, who was part of their close friendship group. Uh, and obviously Barucki couldn't get him in person because he's in Arizona with the Cubs. Right. But uh, but Romano and Jansen together and um, and good. You know what? People who've listened to my podcast know that it's good long form stuff, not the three and a half minutes that I used to do when, you know, that's all I had for a radio pregame show. But these are good, like 10, 12 minute interviews with with all of them, with Springer and Manoa and Vlad, uh, Romano and Jano. It's a it's a, an outstanding uh, group of conversations. Well, it sounds like you've got a, a good kind of swath of, of, of the roster there, pieces of, of the rotation, pe- pieces of the lineup, pieces of the bullpen. You know, in your last few days down there, what's the vibe been like around the team as they get ready to, to set out on the on opening day? It's interesting. I hadn't even really thought about it that way, but uh, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> um, the, the vibe is it's time to get the hell out of here. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the vibe is that spring training has been going on too long and we're ready and let's go already and we've had enough. And that's typical of the vibe on, you know, March 26, 7, 8 in spring training, but especially this year when spring training has been a week longer because of the World Baseball Classic. Mm-hmm. Um, they are there they're very much ready to go. Uh, lots of news coming out, you know, over the last couple of days. Maybe nothing bigger than the uh, the note that we're going to get, what did they call it, the poutine hot dog at the Rogers Center. Does that interest you at all? Are you going to be seeking out a little investigative journalism? Are you going to go looking for one? Absolutely not. That is uh, <laughs> definitely not my bag, no. <laughs> it really wasn't calling out to me either. Uh, I applaud the initiative. Uh, apparently wasn't a crowd pleaser. But um, I, I guess, you know, the, the only real question left when we got into the final week was the 26th man, and that's always kind of the way it looks as, as you know, most of the, the, the spots have been 
locked in for most of this camp. It is Nathan Lucas. Were you surprised at all about that? Not really. I, I figured it would probably be Nathan Lucas, but it is it is funny the amount of time we spend trying to hammer out the opening day roster when four days later it's probably going to be different, right? It, it's, uh, you know, over the course of the six-month season, they're going to use 35 to 38 to 53 players. Who knows? But Yeah, Gosuke Kato was a fun story last year and didn't last very long, right? right? And, <laughs> yeah, exactly. It was gone in a week and a half. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Nathan Lucas was the MVP of the Buffalo Bisons last year, and he earned the shot, absolutely, and he's had a wonderful spring, and he does a lot of things that they like. Uh, serious speed, great defense in the outfield, but ultimately, he's, you know, not the guy who you really want at the bottom of this roster. You would prefer a right-handed hitter, uh, right-handed hitting outfielder uh, with some pop to spell Dalton Varsho and Kevin Kiermeyer, so that Whit Merrifield doesn't have to play out there all the time. Um, but at the same time, you know, the Blue Jays don't really need a 26th player. Uh, they showed that last year because it was Brad Zimmer right. for most of the season, and he was in just two play defense in the ninth inning and occasionally pinch run. Uh, I don't know that that any of the Blue Jays outfielders require a defensive replacement. So I'm not quite sure if Lucas is going to be that, um, but he'll be a pinch runner uh, for Brandon Belt, for Alejandro Kirk, for guys like that. And we'll see. We'll see how how much he plays. But uh, the reason I think I wasn't surprised for him uh, that it was him is because, you know, the Blue Jays really aren't, sounds kind of mean, uh, aren't terribly concerned with Nathan Lucas's development. Right. Uh, they, they feel like Otto Lopez has a chance to really be special, uh, and having him up to only get three or four at bats a week, uh, would not have been a wonderful use of Otto Lopez. Um, so for, for the amount of time that that player is going to play, Lucas does a lot of things very well and, uh, and he fits. So a story kind of throughout camp is what the, you know, we knew who the guys were likely going to be in the rotation. Um, where would you stack them up, you know, across the division or at least across the American League for the Jays this year? You know, Manoa had that great year, was a Cy Young candidate. Um, Gosman could have been had he had any kind of luck. And uh, and they bring in Chris Bassett and you're looking for a bounce back from Barrios and Kikuchi. How do you stack up this rotation against the teams they're going to go up against this year? I think it's the best in the division, easily, easily, especially with all the injuries that the Yankees have had. Um, and, I, you know, I thought the, I mean, Garrett Cole and Carlos Rodon at the top, phenomenal. Mm -hmm. But Alec Manoa and Kevin Gosman at the top, phenomenal. Um, so even healthy, they, they stack up well. But, yeah, I believe it's, I mean, it, Barrios has to bounce back. And Kikuchi's got to be at least okay. You know, right. fifth starter, if you're going to put up an ERA of four and change, um, that's okay. If you're going to win half the games that your fifth starter starts, that's amazing. So, you know, when you're looking at the bottom of your rotation, um, people often, I think, set expectations way too high. But uh, I do, I don't see another rotation in the division that that stacks up with them now i have more faith i think in barrios than a lot of other people do um i i saw what he did up until last season and also you know last season two-thirds of his starts were really really good um and in fact the blue jays won more games that barrios started than they won when any other one of their starters started. That's why. And he had, yeah, it is. It's crazy. But the thing is, when he blew up, he blew up real good. Yeah. Uh, he, you know, it might have been eight or nine times, and they were horrible, horrible starts. But the rest of the time, he was quite good, not even just average. He was quite good. And so, you know, if he can contain the, the explosions, then he'll be on a really good track to, to bounce back. And this guy's been an all-star and, you know, he, he was the ace of playoff teams in the past in Minnesota. Um, 
so I'm expecting quite a bit from him. It's interesting, and I'm trying to mainly look forward here, but what do you think the difference was between those horrible starts last year and the ones where he was pretty good? Like, did you, I know they probably spent the winter trying to make sure they knew exactly what the problem was. Do you have a handle on, you know, what was going wrong between the good ones and the bad ones last year? No, really. I don't think anybody does yeah. that, but I, I think it, it, you know, I, I looked at it. Um, I, and I tried to do some deep digging too. And I think I, I wrote a column in August or September where if he struck a guy out in the first inning, then he would have an ERA of like three ten, And if he didn't, it would be like 13. <laughs> so I don't know what that means i don't know if first innings if you know if an early strikeout means he's feeling good or his breaking ball is moving especially well or he's got good fastball command but that was a really big hint last year as to how he was going to do hmm. that's interesting it just seems like a little too much to be coincidence but maybe not quite enough to extrapolate what exactly yeah. it meant it's uh uh who do you think you know which Vladdy are we going to see this year? 2022 Vladdy was very good, like a, a one of the top players in baseball, but he wasn't quite 2021 Vladdy. Did we maybe just get a little too attached to 2020 or 2021 Vladdy and expect that that was just what he was going to be, maybe unrealistically so, for the rest of his career? What uh, what do you think we can expect out of him? Yeah, I you know I don't know that anyone has ever averaged 48 home runs a year. It's tough, I eh? think a lot of people <laughs> did expect that from Vlad after he broke through he was so young so talented and you know everyone's been talking for uh since he was 16 about how great he's going to be but everybody had a down year last year every hitter in the major leagues except Aaron Judge right. um I think was not as good as they were the year before it was the pitching really stepped up and um you know where you had People, there were teams with, you know, the Blue Jays finished second in the league in runs scored last year, but the team OPS was probably 100 points lower than it was the year before. Mm -hmm. um, just because in general, offense was really down. So in a down year offensively, Vladdy still had a year that um, most major leaguers would sign up for in a heartbeat he probably would have loved um, to have get those same balls the judge was getting delivered to him right like that maybe was, yeah uh, the, the goldilocks <laughs> balls yeah absolutely um but you know and, and in fact i talked to vladdy about that today and he you know he said he feels like he had a good year last year but there's a lot more in it in him uh and everybody knows that there's a lot more in him and in fact you can listen to that conversation Right after you finish listening to this, flip over to deep left field. But, um, but you know, I, I think that the truth lies somewhere in the middle. I think Vlad is going to have some MVP caliber seasons and some seasons where he's just a well above average major league hitter. Um, but I think that's also the case for every superstar except Mike Trout. Right. Right. When Mike Trout finishes in the top five in MVP voting seven years in a row or whatever it was, <laughs> it's extraordinarily noteworthy because nobody is that good that consistently. And as, as great as Vladdy is, um, you know, people talk about people of a certain vintage anyway, in Toronto talk about Joe Carter and all the hundred RBI seasons in a row. And he had, I don't know what it was, seven, eight, nine, ten, hundred RBI seasons in a row. But in some of those, he hit 230. Right. And in some of them, he hit 270. And he never walked. And in some of them, he hit 35 homers. And some of them, he hit 24 home runs. <laughs> so, you know, there there's always vari variation in performance in in uh, in output because these guys are human beings. Um, but Vladimir Guerrero Jr. is going to be one of the best hitters in the league every year. Uh, they brought in somebody perhaps to bat right behind him this year to bring a little left-handed pop as long as everything stays healthy. Uh, a rough 2022 for Brendan Belt. Before that, man, another just elite bat. 
Uh, what's kind of the buzz been around him this spring? We didn't see a ton of him, especially early on. Is he healthy? Is he good to go? What do you think we can expect out of him this year? I think you can expect tremendous at bats every time he's at the plate. Um, you know, Brandon Belt, first of all, pulled the ultimate veteran move in the uh, final game of spring training. He was the DH. He came up in the first inning, drove in two runs with a single, and then was immediately pinch run for. And that is how you do it. <laughs> it's a good that's day what at you the do office. at the end of spring training. That's <laughs> yeah. right. An excellent day at the office. Um, but, you know, every time it felt like I looked up and Brandon Bell was at the plate, the count was full. This is a guy who really, really knows what he's doing up there and knows how to grind a pitcher and knows how to work in a bat. Uh, and in fact, the two run single uh, today was against a left handed pitcher. I don't expect him to play too often against left handed pitchers, right. but that was good to see. Um, he, you know, this is a guy who had a 21 pitch at bat five years ago, uh, which is a, a modern day major league record. Um, he is a uh, like almost the definite, you look up professional hitter, and that's Brandon Belt. And he also comes with two World Series rings. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the, he's, he's someone who, when he speaks, guys listen. Uh, and he's someone who understands what winning is about and also understands how to have a good time while doing it. I, you know, he, he unlocked something in the COVID season. And then in 2021, a guy who had never hit 20 home runs in his career, uh, mostly I think because he played in San Francisco, which is a horrible ballpark to hit in. Yeah. If you are a left-handed hitter who's not Barry Bonds, <laughs> um, but in 2021 he had 37 home runs in 97 games, or 34 homers, or something like that. So he really unlocked something in his swing, and he told me, you know, that he felt like. Um, those two years when he was one of the best hitters in baseball, 20 and 21, um, that he, he found it. And then his knee uh, went on him and he couldn't do anything. So now the knee's healthy and surgically repaired. It's not like they're, you know, he's feeling good and hopefully something will happen, but they, they went in and they fixed it. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to see what they get out of Brandon Belt. This is a guy who is going to hit for a decent batting average. He's going to walk a lot. And I think there's power in there. I think there are home runs in there uh, and and quite a few. Um, and I can see him being their clean, primary cleanup hitter against right-handed pitching and doing quite well. There's a chance that the changes they've made at the Dome there are going to benefit him quite a bit. So certainly compared to San Francisco, as you noted there. Um, one yeah, other individual, absolutely. yeah. One other individual I wanted to ask you about before uh, moving on here was just the last time you were on with me, right around the holiday season. The Jays had just brought in uh, Dalton Varsho, and you were extremely bullish on him, talking about the defense that he was going to bring to the team. Um, you know, what kind of spring did you think he, or do you think he had? How was he kind of fitting in with the group? And you know, or do you remain as uh, as bullish as you were then? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, first of all, nothing that happens in spring will change my opinion of a player because sure. I, you know, I believe that um, the whatever 600 plate appearances they get in a regular season and the thousands of, of at bats that they've had over their careers mean a lot more than the 46 at bats in spring. It's probably fair. If even that. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, but the truth is, I didn't see much of our show this spring i think he only played like four or five games i was i was at um so i i did see the interactions in the clubhouse with um you know he was in a, in a corner with whit merrifield and george springer um and uh Bo Bichette and vladimir guerrero were, were right there with him and and it, it lo really looked like he was uh fitting into the group very well guys were cracking on him quite a bit and having fun with him. And, and uh, that was good. And, you know, his dad played in the big leagues and his dad coached in the big leagues. So he sort of fits in that way with Vlad and Bo and, and Kevin Biggio um, having grown up in a major league clubhouse. So that's good too. But, you know, ultimately I think 
too, the changes, like you mentioned with Belt, are really going to play into Varsho's power, too, because Atlanta is, uh, or Arizona, pardon me, uh, is a, a pitcher friendly, maybe, like it's neutral, pitcher friendly leaning as a ballpark, especially since they brought in their humidor. Right. Um, and Roger Center is going to be extraordinarily hitter friendly, especially for left handed pull hitters, uh, with, which of our show is. And there's no shift, which is also especially friendly for left handed pull hitters. Um, so, uh, first of all, I don't know. I mean, you can't say it doesn't matter what he does offensively because you've already got Kevin Kiermeyer, who's going to be your nine hitter, and who it really doesn't matter what he does offensively. But Varsho had 27 home runs last year in Arizona and playing in the NL West where every ballpark but Coors Field is, is like a cavern. So <laughs> I can, I see him hitting 40. And, um, you know, he'll walk a bit. He, he'll, he'll get you 10, 12, 15 bunt singles, uh, which is a really cool weapon of his that people are going to enjoy. Um, and he's going to play anyone the hell enjoy? Out of My field. Twitter feed says no one enjoys the bunt at this point. But. The sacrifice bunt, no, but the bunt hit Fair enough. for sure. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, he's going to play the hell out of left field, which which is going to be fantastic. I mean, the Blue Jays for the last few years have had bad corner outfielders, like legitimately bad corner outfielders in Lourdes Gurriel Jr. and Teoscar Hernandez. And I understand. Uh, the Guriel was a gold glove finalist a time or two. And Guriel's arm made up for a lot of his poor roots and, um, you know, lack of range. And so did Tay Oscars. And, and occasionally the, uh, the two of them would both just seem to have like little brain locks on plays. Um, that's gone now. They've got three center fielders playing in the outfield. Um, two of whom are among the best defenders in the game. And George Springer is no slouch either. So it's, it's going to be, you know, I don't, I think a lot of the the things people won't notice, like they'll just make a catch and people will say, okay, they just made a catch. Not thinking that, you know, if Guriel is out there, that's a single. Right. Or if Rymel Toppy is playing there, that falls in down the line and gets by him for a double. Um, so, you know, we might not notice things, but, and, and people might not notice how quickly Varsho and Kiermaier get to balls that fall in front of them and keep runners from taking an extra base and keep guys from going first to third. Those things don't show up in the box score, but they show up in wins. And I think at the end of the season, we're going to look up and be like, wow, Gosman was incredible this year. And man, Barrios really bounced back and Manoa was even better than before. Um, and a lot of that's going to be because of the outfielders. Right. Things just getting caught that weren't getting caught before. Uh, it's yeah. it's a 10-game road trip that uh, starts off the season in St. Louis, then Kansas City, Anaheim, and then back home for the home opener. You know they'll be looking to get off to a good start. Last year by, it felt like mid-May, the division was gone. The Yankees just ran away with the thing. Um, you know, this the team has undergone some changes, but, uh, you know, so it's a, certainly it's a different roster. There's been some talk about how much better of a roster it is. You know, where would you pick or where would you put the number for, you know, a likely... Uh, likely set of wins this year it's a, it's a tough one because of the change of the schedule yeah. right it'll be really interesting for me anyway to see what that does that you, you know you don't have to be in that al east meat grinder as much they play five fewer games against the yankees and the red sox and the rays and that the orioles aren't bad either anymore right. Um, and, you know, the, the AL East will just eat you up and chew you out, but now it's 20 fewer games in the division, and how much does that help? Not just in those games, but in the series that follow, because, you know, those games against the Yankees and Rays just murder your bullpen, too, and, um, you know, so I, I'm I'm interested. To, like, I think there are three teams in the AL East that could win 100 games this year with this with the new schedule, but we'll see. I mean, I, I think uh, a reasonable number to put them at is 95. Uh, I think they are 
play. I'm I'm really excited about the changes in the defense, and I think that's going to help a lot. Um, but yeah, look, 91 two years ago, 92 last year. I can see 95 with the division. They did. But don't forget, too, that they were on a, an historical pace mm-hmm. for wins as late as like the second week of July. They were on pace for like 122 wins uh, in the season. So they were running away with any division Ever. no matter what. Yeah. Uh, and the Jays did not spend a day last season when they weren't in a playoff spot. No, it's true. They, uh, there were, the, it didn't feel, and it probably was that Yankees run that just made what the Jays feel like kind of blah, right? Like they were playing well. They were a playoff team, as you said, but you just, you look and, oh man, there's somebody that much better than you still out there. It, it, it kind of took a little of the fun out of it almost, right? Like it, it's, it messed with the perspective maybe more than anything else or the perception. Maybe. And uh, hopefully, and, I say hopefully like like there's actually a chance it'll happen. It won't, but uh, that you know, people will learn that it doesn't you know, what what's more important than winning the division is making the playoffs. Yep. You know, the five and six seeds in the National League went to the NLCS last year. Um, as long as you make the playoffs, it's better to to win the division, obviously, with one of the top two records in the league because then you get that by. Yes. But getting to the you playoffs is, that is Seattle what really, debacle. really matters. <laughs> yeah. Avoid that Seattle debacle, but who knows? There might have been a, a, a Seattle debacle in the second round. True um, enough, yes. But that, that's something that's never happened before and hopefully will never happen again. But, um, but yeah, just, just get there. And there's, you know, there shouldn't be any question that the Blue Jays are one of the six best teams in the American League. No, no, I think that's right. Uh, uh, it's opening day coming up. It's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be a great season. I'm sure I'll, I'll come bug you again, but uh, tell the people once more where they can find uh, or tell them about the podcast once more, what you got coming up here. Yeah, well, you can find uh, the podcast. It's called Deep Left Field, wherever finer podcasts are available. Um and the opening day extravaganza, which drops on opening day, Makes uh, sense. will feature, you know, conversations with George Springer and Alec Manoa and Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and Danny Jansen and Jordan Romano. And, and it's a, it's going to be a, a really spectacular show. So please subscribe and, and uh, check it out every week because honestly, there there's not a baseball podcast that gets you closer to the action than this one does we've got the you know the newsmakers on every week as they're making news um the last year we had ross stripling on every week i don't think we're gonna get one particular blue jay on every week but i'm gonna try to do a rotation of monthly you know there will be four or five of them who come on once a month and then sprinkle in the other um whoever's whoever's making noise that week mm-hmm. uh, whatever cool story there is but uh, but really as far as you know in-depth conversations with the people in uniform there's there's nowhere else to go yeah uh strangely Vladdy and and Springer and those guys aren't taking my calls but uh, Mike does and we appreciate it we'll get this second hand and yeah certainly check out the uh, the deep left field podcast. Mike, it's going to be a fun season. Um, I appreciate you making some time during what I know is a, a busy time of year for you as you're commuting across Florida here on the journey home. Um, you know, enjoy the season, enjoy opening day, and, and we'll talk soon. Thanks uh, very much. Yeah, happy to happy to do it. Happy anytime, and thanks for keeping me company on this uh, <laughs> on this ride. All right, there he goes. Always fun to talk to Mike Wilner. Appreciate him uh, squeezing us in during a very busy time of year. Baseball writers, baseball broadcasters, uh, the week of opening day, a lot of restraints on their time, so we appreciate Mike making some time for us. Uh, Don't forget, we're on social media at Tall Can Audio. Give us a follow there and subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcatcher, I guess is what the cool kids are calling them. Uh, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Pods, uh, we're on all of them. Give us a follow, pick one, and and, and, uh, stick around with us. It's going to be a lot of fun. Don't forget, Chris Hoffley from the Ottawa Sports and Entertainment Group will be here on Monday. And uh, later next week, Dan Schulman from the Blue Jays broadcast team will have some actual real-life baseball games that actually count. 
in the rear view by then, so he'll give us his ex extremely early thoughts on what we've seen out of the Blue Jays, and uh, we'll just catch up and talk some baseball with Dan. Um, always fun to do that. Until then, my name is Matt Robinson. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Tall Can Audio. We'll see you all on the next one. That's it. I cannot work under these conditions. If anybody wants me, I'll be downstairs at McDougal. Call the weekend guy. I don't care.